Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining my talk. My name is Azad Amoradinejad, and I'm a research associate at the University of Geneva. Today, I'm going to talk about large-scale structure probes of the early universe. More specifically, my talk, my talk will be focused on using clustering statistics of bias tracers to constrain primordial long Gaussianity in order to learn about the physics of the early universe. The results that I will show will be based on uh, several works with a number of uh, amazing people, which I would list as references during the talk. So here is the outline of my talk. I will first give a general overview of what we can learn about the origin of the structure from detection or high precision constraints on primordial long Gaussianity and describe the cosmological uh, imprints of long Gaussian initial conditions. With this introduction, then focusing on large scale structure, I will present three sets of results. First, the prospects of constraining non Gaussianity using intensity mapping technique. Here, I will focus on power spectrum of intensity fluctuations um, to constrain local shape non Gaussianity. Next, I will illustrate the significance of using bias spectrum of uh, large scale structure in constraining non Gaussianity. And in this case, I will uh, focus on galaxy clustering, although the discussions are rather general and they are applicable uh, largely in the context of uh, line intensity mapping as well. Lastly, I will describe an alternative and uh, efficient estimators uh, referred to as weighted skew spectra that could allow us to extract the information uh, in the bispectrum at a computational cost of power spectrum uh, analysis. So in the standard paradigm of the early universe, the universe went through a phase of accelerated expansion referred to as cosmic inflation. And during this era, the seed of all uh, the structure that we observe today were set by quantum fluctuations of inflaton field. These fluctuations get imprinted on distribution of radiation and matter. And today we observe the fluctuations in the radiation that were emitted when the universe was very young as cosmic microwave background. The fluctuations in the matter density grow under the influence of gravity to form the large scale structure that we observe today. So by mapping the, the, the LSS, we can infer the uh, physics of the very early universe. The most well established mean of mapping the large scale structure is measurements of uh, shape and clustering statistics of galaxies as is done in galaxy survey. In the current generations, the, the galaxy surveys are limited to redshift one, and in the upcoming years, these measurements will be pushed to higher redshifts. Additionally, the newly emerging observational technique of intensity mapping is providing an exciting prospect to probe cosmology by mapping the large scale structure over a range of redshifts and scales that are largely beyond the reach of galaxy surveys. So for the rest of the talk, I will discuss about uh, various aspects of using observations of line intensity mapping, uh, as well as uh, galaxy cluster and the statistics to constrain primordial non Gaussianity. As of intensity mapping, I will discuss about intensity mapping with emission lines originating from inside galaxy uh, uh, star forming galaxies. Uh, and in particular, I will be focusing on rotational line or lines of CO uh, as well as uh, fine transition line of uh, ionized carbon. So uh, let us first take a few minutes of uh, reviewing and reminding ourselves of uh, what we know about uh, inflation uh, and what we uh, can learn and how we can learn more about it. Um, so of course, assuming a phase of asteroid expansion in the early universe offers an elegant solution to uh, horizon and flatness problems in the standard Big Bang theory. But the way that we can really test whether inflation happened is by constraining the statistical properties of scalar and tensor primordial fluctuations using their imprints on the CMB and large scale structure. Uh, from the latest measurements of uh, CMB fluctuations by Planck satellite, we know that the primordial scalar fluctuations have nearly scale invariant power spectrum. And we also have an upper bound on the amount of gravitational waves generated during inflation. And these bounds are shown in the plot at the bottom, uh, which shows the tensor to scalar ratio versus the spectral index of um, scalar fluctuations. From the measurements of the three point function of uh, CMB fluctuations, we also know that the primordial anisotropies have nearly Gaussian um, uh, statistics. Um, in the years to come, 
uh, our understanding of the early universe is expected to significantly improve uh, via measurements of gravitational waves, which will tell us about energy scale of inflation, uh, as well as measurements of deviations from Gaussian field of the initial conditions, which will tell us about the field content and interactions during inflation. While for the latter, the CMB observations are of course leading the way uh, in the, for, uh, sorry, while for the former, the CMB observations are leading the way uh, in, in, in for the latter, the large scale structure uh, observations are expected to play the key role. Um, so uh, first to set the notation, uh, we often characterize deviations from Gaussianity at lowest order by parameter FML, which is defined in terms of uh, the, the ratio of the three point correlation function of primordial uh, fluctuations uh, to the square of the two point function. If the initial conditions are Gaussian, FML is zero, uh, since the three-point function vanishes, uh, and different models of inflation can generate uh, non-Gaussianity um, that has different forms or different types of the three-point function. So the goal will be to constrain the amplitude of these different shapes of non-Gaussianity, which will eventually and hopefully allow us to distinguish between inflation models and pinpoint the physics at play during inflation. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have more than one field present during inflation and those fields are light, uh, uh, we, we, will, uh, we, you know, we, we can have local type non-Gaussianity and phenomenologically this type of non-Gaussianity can be parametrized as a quadratic correction to the Gaussian scalar field. In this case, since this all single field models of inflation are expected to uh, produce negligible amount of local non-Gaussianity, if we detect the FML uh, local of order unity, it would allow us to exclude uh, sing more, more single field models of inflation. Now, uh, looking at the distribution of radiation and matter, having, for instance, local shape non-Gaussianity with positive FML would lead to more structure in the blue spots of the CMB, which are tracers are over dense regions, while in dark matter distribution, positive values of FNL will result in having uh, more massive halo and a larger number of massive halos and delay of the formation on the, on the dense regions. So uh, by measurements of the three-point function uh, on radiation uh, fluctuations or the matter fluctuations, we are able to um, set constraints and infer uh, the, the, the amplitude of the uh, primordial, uh, primordial bispectrum. Now, when we talk about bias tracers, there is an additional imprint that show up at the level of the two-point function of, uh, of the bias tracers. And bias tracers here can refer to halos, galaxies, or intensity maps, which um, are, are bias tracers of dark matter, and this relation on large scales can be defined as a linear um, scale independent um, coefficient. Uh, when we have Gaussian initial conditions, if we split the fluctuations into long and short modes, there is no physical coupling between the two, and the, the small scale fluctuations uh, will, uh, uh, will collapse to form halos, galaxies, and so on, once they pass, once their amplitude passes the threshold. And this, the, their formation, the formation and the collapse of the small scale fluctuations is independent of whether they are in the peak or the trough of the large scale fluctuation. Now, when we have non-Gaussianity of local shape, for instance, uh, the story is different because in this case, the large scale gravitational potential is a uh, physical quantity and there is a, a coupling between the short scale and large scale fluctuations. So the, the small scale fluctuations that are in the peak of the large scale mode will collapse differently than the ones uh, that are at the trough. And this will uh, result in a scale dependent correction to this uh, linear biasing on large scales, uh, and it will show up as an uh, enhancement or suppression of the power spectrum on the largest scales. And that is what is shown in this plot, which is the power spectrum of halos versus the wave number uh, in the cases that, all, that the initial condition is Gaussian for the green versus um, uh, non-Gaussian uh, uh, with FNL local of positive 100 or negative 100. Um, let me also mention that uh, if, uh, in, in the context of effective bias expansion for uh, bias tracers, when we have primordial non-Gaussianity, this means that in this bias expansion, we now need to introduce new sets of operate new set of operators that are proportional to gravitational potential at, the, at early times. And the amplitudes of these uh, 
or the, the coefficients of this bias expansion in principle are nuisance parameters that we have to marginalize over in our analysis. Um, in the first part of the talk, I will assume that uh, um, as is common uh, assumption, that we know the amplitude of this non-Gaussian bias. Uh, while in the second part, I will show how important it is to write a, a consistent model where we allow for these biases to be free parameters. So uh, the current best constraints on uh, local shape non-Gaussian entity come from measurements of the power spectrum uh, of galaxies in uh, EBOS data. And as you can see, this is still um, significantly uh, weaker than the constraints from uh, CMB. Uh, in the coming years, as I mentioned, it is expected that these constraints will significantly improve and uh, they would improve hopefully by both measurements of the power spectrum and by spectrum. Now, let me take a second to uh, kind of uh, review um, whether uh, given that this, uh, the potential of the power spectrum to constrain local non gaussianity we can ask what's the maximum information included in the power spectrum and how we can go beyond uh, the, uh, uh, having that information. And that this question was nicely answered and addressed in this uh, paper uh, that is now a few years old, where uh, the one sigma, the, the plot here shows the one sigma constraints on FML as a function of the maximum redshifts that is covered by a given survey. Uh, for the case that we have a single tracer of, uh, of dark matter shown in the uh, dashed yellow um, versus uh, having uh, a survey that can probe multiple tracers uh, covering all the, all the way to redshift 10. And these different ones correspond to having different number of, uh, of multiple tracers. As we can see here, in the case of single um, tracer, in the best case scenario, we will be able to get one sigma constraints on FNL of about 0.1 if we were able to probe up to redshift 10. So probing high redshifts here is, is, is very uh, important. Um, and, and as shown in these other lines, having in the idea, ideal case of uh, being able to do multi-tracer with many tracers up to redshift 10, we could improve those constraints by an order of magnitude. But to go beyond these constraints, we we'll need to go beyond the power spectrum. So, um, this is kind of the context of uh, the rest of the talk. I will discuss about intensity mapping as a mean of probing higher redshifts to improve the constraints on uh, local long density from the power spectrum. And I will discuss about significance of the higher order statistics in constraining not only local shape, but also other shapes of long density. So now let's meet, let me move on to the first part of the talk, uh, constraining local long density from power spectrum of intensity fluctuations. So uh, uh, some uh, basics of intensity mapping technique, uh, in contrast to galaxy surveys in which we measure shape and clustering of individual sources, in intensity mapping, uh, large-scale structure is mapped by measuring cumulative light from ensemble of sources or intergalactic medium. And the spatial fluctuations of the intensity of the line together with the frequency of the line provide a three-dimensional map of, uh, uh, of LSS. The plot on the right is showing a simulated two degree square patch of the sky, as can be observed in radio galaxies with a survey like VLA, versus intensity mapping of CO rotational line with a, uh, with a survey like uh, Coma. While the uh, galaxy surveys, uh, well, while the galaxy survey will uh, map only 10% of the sources uh, in that patch of the sky, of course, the intensity mapping gets the light from all the sources and can provide us a low resolution map. Of, uh, of the light space uh, structure. Um, as I mentioned, there are various candidates that have been considered for intensity mapping, the most familiar of which is the hyperfine transition of neutral hydrogen in, uh, in 21 centimeter wavelength, schematically shown at the bottom. Uh, what I will discuss are the uh, fine transition line of uh, ionized carbon uh, and rotational lines of the CO. As a reference, um, uh, the frequencies uh, of uh, 21 centimeters above is in the 1.5 gigahertz regime, while the CO and C2 are in the 100 and 1000 gigahertz um, correspondingly. So let me uh, uh, take a second to mention here that uh, uh, mapping large scale structure with different tracers is, is important, is significant uh, in, in various ways. And uh, in particular, um, uh, having multiple tracers to do intensity mapping uh, is beneficial because we can, uh, these different lines have uh, different systematics and foregrounds and having different lines would allow us to have a robust detection of the signal 
In addition to uh, achieving improved constraints on uh, cosmological parameters beyond what, uh, what is uh, uh, obtainable from a single tracer. So um, with that, now let's uh, ask the question of what is the strength of the intensity mapping when, uh, that, that makes it stand out. And uh, the key uh, words here are probing high redshifts and ultra large scales. As of high redshifts, this um, uh, plot on the left is showing the dark matter distribution on the top uh, left versus the intensity mapping uh, uh, fluctuations that can be observed in 21 centimeter line uh, at redshift five. And uh, uh, the other two plots show the galaxy and Lyman uh, break galaxies and the LSSD sources at that redshift. As we can see, uh, as we go to higher redshifts, we simply run out of galaxies to map the large scale structure while the intensity maps uh, can provide a high fidelity map of the underlying dark matter distribution. Uh, and at those high redshift, the physics is more linear and our theoretical predictions work uh, much better. And uh, we can use many more uh, nearly linear modes that are, uh, deep, uh, that are not uncorrelated uh, from initial conditions. Um, uh, on, uh, with respect to ultra large scales, this plot on the right uh, is a schematically showing the co moving volume that can be uh, covered by galaxy surveys. For instance, um, uh, galaxies uh, observed with DESI uh, in um, white solid and the quasars in the uh, dashed solid, in comparison uh, with the co moving volume that can be covered by various uh, ongoing and proposed 21 centimeter surveys in cyan, yellow, green, and blue. Um, you know, having intensity mapping with CO and C2 additionally would allow us to probe the co moving volume between today to formation of uh, first galaxies. Um, in, in the context of constraining um, primordial non gaussianity of the local shape using intensity mapping, these two features are, are particularly important, as I showed for the high redshift in the, in the, in the previous plot of one sigma constraints. And of course, the larger volume would allow us to probe larger scales where the signatures of local FNL is most pronounced. So, uh, and, and this has led to a lot of work, of course, um, in uh, making forecasts for um, the, the constraining power of 21 centimeter intensity mapping in um, uh, constraining local non Gaussianity, and this included 21 centimeter in different eras. Uh, as of other lines of CCO and C2, our first work showed that uh, from uh, considering uh, a single rotational line of CO, uh, as well as the ionized carbon, we are able to constrain FNL by about uh, three, three or um, sigma FNL of three to four. And uh, let me also mention that these uh, emission lines have been observed in individual galaxies and quasars in the high redshift uh, measurements of ALMA, uh, for instance. And also they have been tentatively obser uh, observed in the auto and cross uh, correlation um, uh, measurements uh, for, for the CO rotational lines and the C2 lines. So based on this encouraging first result, uh, we then moved on to understand what is the optimal survey design and instrument that would allow us to achieve uh, sigma FNL of order unity or better, which is a target sensitivity that would allow us to distinguish and rule out single phase models of inflation. And in that case, uh, we parameterize the, the survey setup by uh, the instrument noise, uh, the, the volume of the survey, which is defined in terms of the sky fraction and the redshift coverage, and the largest and the smallest scales that can be probed by the survey, while the smallest scales are uh, dominated uh, or, or defined by antenna size and resolution of the instrument, we were interested in using a variable for the largest scales to understand the impact of the foregrounds and instrument calibration errors. And the results are shown in this plot on the left, which shows one sigma errors on the FNL as a function of survey parameter, the sky uh, fraction, the redshift coverage or equivalently frequency coverage and the median redshift of the survey. And on the very top, it's the cost of the survey, which is determined in terms of the observing tower in time times the number of uh, detectors. So the question we asked was for a, a fixed uh, cost of a survey, what is the best value of the FNL that we can obtain? The conclusion from this study was that uh, indeed there is a potential of reaching sigma FNL of about one. And to achieve that, it is critical, uh, most importantly, to have broad spectral coverage. And that is shown in the second plot here. And we, so we need uh, the spectral coverage of at least uh, an octave in frequency. And moreover, uh, a, a, a survey that is covering 10% of the sky uh, would be enough to achieve uh, such a sensitivity. 
And then we can uh, we ask the question of this design, how does this design um, uh, lie in the landscape of exper uh, the experiments that, uh, that are designed or that are proposed? And uh, what is the um, uh, weakness of each of these experiments that is not uh, that are not able to reach a vanilla world of unity? For instance, um, the uh, Origin Space Telescope has uh, uh, limited sky coverage, and if we could have a full sky uh, survey with the specifications of the uh, uh, of the MS uh, um, OSD instrument that is covering wider redshift range, that could allow us to go uh, and sigma FNL of below one. And real notice that this is from power spectrum only. So of course, adding the bispectrum can significantly improve about uh, these numbers. And interestingly enough, a survey uh, that is uh, not that far, that, that is envisionable to, uh, to have in the shorter timeline um, could achieve sigma FML of about uh, three, uh, three uh, with a sky coverage about 3% of the um, uh, sky uh, covering the redshift between three to nine. And these are surveys that could be thought of as uh, uh, surveys to cross correlate with 21 centimeter measurements with Terra. So basically, with such surveys uh, that, and that are designed to, to be used to confirm the cosmological origin of 21 centimeter, we could have a free science of constraining uh, local long gas energy. Um, and then, of course, because the constraints on local long gas energy are very sensitive to uh, access to very large scale modes, uh, we went further to effectively parameterize the contamination of the largest scale modes and uh, study the impact on the constraining uh, power of intensity mapping. And uh, in this respect, we introduced two free parameters, um, uh, parameter A and mean, which captures contaminations of the modes uh, perpendicular to the line of sight, and a parameter theta max, which will um, um, parameterize the, the loss of modes in the direction, um, the loss of the, the, the modes that are totally parallel to the line of sight. And, um, uh, the, the former uh, captures the um, loss of modes due to the unsmooth spectral response of the instrument to the continuum emission, while the latter uh, will uh, take care of uh, uh, accounting for position dependent errors in the estimation of the amplitude of the signal. Um, and then um, the results of, of this uh, study are shown in these two plots, which shows the one sigma error bars on FML. Um, as a function of these two parameters. Uh, and uh, as we can see, the loss of modes uh, in the parallel to the line of sight directions are uh, more, uh, have a more significant impact on the constraints on FML as the slope of the um, graph on the right is much steeper than the one on the, uh, on the, the one on the left is more steeper than the one on the right. So, um, so, so with that now, um, let me summarize what I said um, that I highlighted the uh, potential of uh, measurements of the power spectrum of uh, CO and CQ intensity in constraining local long gas energy. Of course, I have not shown any results uh, about using the bispectrum in this context, um, but we should keep in mind that the constraints that are forecasted here can be significantly improved if we can also measure the bispectrum or intensity fluctuations. Now, in the context of galaxy clustering, I'm going to uh, highlight the significance of the bispectrum. And in this uh, part, I will discuss um, uh, two, um, kind of two, two uh, sets of results. First, in the context of local long gas uh, I will discuss how the combination of the power spectrum with bispectrum can improve the constraints on FNL and, uh, and, and how the um, uh, we can, we can characterize the impact of modeling assumption and uh, assume parameter priors in the inferred value of FNL. Then I will discuss very briefly about uh, how we can also use bispectrum to constrain very interesting um, non-Gaussianity shapes that are not leaving any imprint on the power spectrum and can only be constrained by the bispectrum. And those are non uh, primordial non-Gaussianity that is uh, generated by having uh, massive fields with potentially with non-zero spin uh, present during inflation. And I will discuss the prospects of measuring uh, such a signal in, in um, gal upcoming galaxy surveys. So um, in, in the first part, um, to, to understand the impact of modeling ingredients and the choice of priors and so on on the inferred values of FNL, 
uh, we test the model, uh, we, we construct a consistent uh, models of one loop power spectrum and three level by spectrum, and we test predictions of this model against a full set of uh, numerical simulations. Um, uh, we have four sets of simulations with Gaussian initial conditions of FNL0 and, uh, and uh, FNL10 and plus minus 250. Having simulations with large FNL allows us to really study the impact of primordial non-Gaussianity uh, since the, the effect is more um, exaggerated for such large values, uh, while having FNL10 simulations would allow us to now ask the question of uh, the impact of those ingredients for realistic values of FNL according to the current constraints. And let me also mention that having simulation with positive and negative FNL has the advantage that it allows you to really isolate the effects that are linear in FNL uh, compared to those that are quadratic in FNL. Um, so we, we also have simulations with varying sigma that allows us to directly measure the non, um, linear non-Gaussian bias. And uh, we do the measurements on uh, uh, three um, halo mass spins that range from 9, 10 to the 12 to 2, uh, 10 to the 15. And we measure, uh, we make all the measurements at redshift one. So uh, in, uh, in terms of the theoretical modeling, as I said, uh, halos and galaxies are biased tracers of underlying dark matter. In the, in the, in the case of Gaussian initial conditions, uh, we, we have to write the bias expansion that deter include deterministic local terms that, that are proportional to matter density field and its derivatives, as well as the stochastic contributions that account for uh, effect of small scale um, contribution to the large scale fluctuations. And you also have to have um, terms that are non-local in, in density field, uh, or they are, in, in other words, they are higher derivatives of uh, matter density field. When we have primordial non-Gaussianity, as I mentioned earlier, now we have to introduce new set of operators um, constructed from gravitational potential at early times. And these terms would all be proportional to FNL and the uh, bias uh, parameters um, are again, uh, considered a new sense parameters that has to be marginalized. So we write the, uh, the models of the power spectrum and bias spectrum with the following three parameters, and we marginalize over all these parameters to infer the value of FNL. So here is, for instance, one of the results. It's a, it's a busy plot, but um, let me draw your attention to, to uh, a subset of the conclusions from here. So first of all, looking at the uh, row at the very bottom, which are constraints on FNL, uh, versus all the other model parameters, we see that from both power spectrum by spectrum, we can uh, infer unbiased value of FNL um, uh, that, that, uh, that basically agrees with the fiducial value of FNL of the simulations, which was FNL 50 in this case. Um, when we use bispectrum uh, by itself, we obtain about a factor of two improvement uh, beyond what uh, can uh, what our spectrum can, um, can can achieve, and that is shown in comparison of the blue contours that are power spectrum only versus the green contours. Furthermore, when we combine the power spectrum by spectrum, there is an additional twenty percent improvement in the signal, and that is shown in the red contours. Uh, it, it, it should be very uh, it should be very importantly noted that uh, the power spectrum only constraints are, are dominated by the choice of priors on uh, linear non Gaussian bias and the reason for that is that uh, this non linear non Gaussian bias is fully degenerate with FNL accounting for loop contributions to uh, power spectrum partially breaks this um, degeneracy but um, but only uh, very mildly. Uh, and adding the bias spectrum allows us to um, alleviate significantly this degeneracy. Um, and, uh, and also let me mention that as has been computed before, we do measure the FNL dependent corrections to the linear uh, Gaussian and non-Gaussian biases, which can be seen for instance from the uh, fourth row from the top, uh, which are constraints on D1, if you compare the, the best value of uh, shown in the contour with the dashed line, which is the measurement of linear bias uh, from Gaussian simulations, we see a shift, we see a shift downward, which is due to the uh, scale uh, independent corrections to the to D1 uh, due to primordial long Gaussianity. Now, next, we wanted to understand uh, what's the impact of uh, the prior that are assumed on the parameters. In particular, we wanted to see um, how the, the assumption of universal mass function, which results in having 
the value of uh, B5 as a function of Gaussian biases, B1 and B2, we wanted to see how this assumption affects the inferred uh, values of FML. And here is the, uh, the result. In this case, we see that, of course, since the size of parameter space is, uh, is reduced, um, we obtain uh, uh, tighter constraints on FML. Uh, however, we, we get a significant systematic shift in the, in the value of FML and linear bias. And, and as you can see, the contours basically uh, are shifted with respect to the horizontal line here, which, which is the fiducial value of FML. So now with this uh, analysis of the FML 250, we then moved on to um, uh, study the impact of these ingredients on simulations with FML 10. And here is the summary plot from uh, this analysis. Let me draw your attention to the top red lines and the bottom purple lines, which correspond to the previous two cases for which I showed the contour plot. So the red one is the full model uh, varying all the bias parameters from power spectrum only on top and from Y spectrum and then the combination. So the first thing you notice here is in the case of FNL10 simulations, since the impact of local long Gaussianity on the power spectrum is less significant, adding the Y spectrum results in more uh, significant improvement in the constraints by a factor of five. Um, and uh, if you assume again, a strong priors on uh, uh, non Gaussian biases, uh, we obtain a significantly uh, decreased error bars, as you can see by comparing the size of these error bars with the ones on the top, um, but we get a bias estimate of FML, and that we can uh, see by comparing the, the best fit values of, of these um, uh, analysis with the vertical dashed line, which shows the fiducial uh, value of our simulations. And uh, furthermore, we, uh, we also tested whether uh, by using Bayesian model selection, we could exclude FNL, the value of FNL equal to zero for these simulations. And the answer was no, unfortunately, with this uh, sensitivity, we cannot exclude uh, FNL zero at high uh, significance. So uh, now let me also say a few words uh, about um, how for, for the other shapes of non gaussianity that they do not leave any imprint on the power spectrum, the bias spectrum is the only way. And in particular, there is a very interesting prospect uh, of being able to constrain presence of particles and uh, measure the mass and potentially the spin of those particles from measurements of the bias spectrum. Now here, an analogy can be made with Hadron Collider in which we uh, use the jets, we, we look at the jets and the energy deposition on the detector to, to detect new particles. In the context of cosmology, we look at the patterns in the uh, distribution of CMB and LSS, so specifically measurements of higher order correlations to detect new particles. And, uh, and, and all the local shape non Gaussianity I discussed can be thought of as massless zero spin particles, while um, what, uh, what I will talk now is um, uh, the cases of uh, having massive particles with zero or non zero spin or massless particles with non zero spin. And in this case, the signatures are uh, potentially measurable if the mass of the particle is of the order of Hubble parameter in the equation. So in this case, the interesting signatures on the bias spectrum are the following. So if you look at the plot on the right, which shows the shape uh, of the bias spectrum versus the ratio of the two wave numbers, as we go to the left, we are in the squeeze triangles while going to the right, we are in the uh, uh, equilateral configuration of the bias spectrum. And the thing to notice here is that as we go towards the squeeze limit, there is an oscillatory feature in the bias spectrum. And the oscillatory feature has a frequency that is determined by this parameter nu s, which is a, com a combination of the mass and the spin of the particle. Uh, there is also an additional imprint on the bias spectrum, which is a specific uh, dependence on the angles between the two um, sides of the triangle. And uh, that shape can be um, uh, effectively um, uh, parameterized as uh, Legendre polynomials of order S, where, this, uh, where, the, where the order of the genre polynomial is determined by the spin of the particle. So on the plot on the left, is showing again the shape function, uh, but now in a different basis uh, as, a, as a function of the angle between the two wave numbers. And the black line is the Legendre polynomial of order S, for instance, while the red lines show the, uh, the, the actual effect of these higher spin particles on the bias spectrum. So the shape is very well reproduced uh, with uh, the genre polynomials. Uh, 
Now, uh, building the template based on the theoretical predictions for this type of non-Gaussianity, we then um, tested whether we can constrain this, this type of non-Gaussianity from its imprint on the power spectrum. And the answer was the effect is suppressed, so it's very hard to use power spectrum in this case. But the bias spectrum offers a, 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 an exciting um, prospect. And uh, we, if we measure the amplitude of this type of non-Gaussianity with, with the error bar of, uh, of, of one or better, we would be able um, to um, measure the mass by 10% uh, accuracy. And this is very exciting because we can basically probe presence of particles at the highest energy scales during inflation. So um, now let me uh, move on to the last part of the talk. And in this part, I will go beyond the standard ways of extracting information from higher order statistics, which I, I talked about until now, which was measurements of bispectrum or uh, going at higher order trispectrum. In this case, um, I would like to spare a few minutes to discuss an alternative way of extracting the information from the bispectrum and it can be potentially powerful for constraining FNL, growth rate, and uh, galaxy biases uh, in, a, in a more efficient way than counting the triangles for measuring the bi spectrum. So um, what, what I have presented in the previous parts are, are mainly the, um, the, the potential of uh, the bi spectrum in improving constraints on FNL, but I haven't talked about the challenges. And the challenge here, uh, it lies both on the theoretical and computational front. Now, this has led uh, to a large body of work in uh, pursuing alternative strategies. And uh, one, one approach has been constructing proxy statistics that fully or partially capture the information in the bispectrum. And uh, one of the such as uh, estimators, which I will discuss, are uh, weighted skew spectra. Uh, which, as I, I, I will uh, describe, uh, may offer an optimal and efficient uh, way of extracting information from my spectrum. What are these uh, weighted skew spectra? So in comparison with uh, measurement of the bias spectrum, in which we measure the correlation between three points in, uh, in of the density field, uh, guided by perturbation theory, we can find the relevant operators describing the nonlinear evolution and then from, uh, by computing the two-point correlation of these composite operators and the original field, we can extract the information in endpoint statistics. So for instance, in the case, of, uh, uh, in the case where we neglect redshift space distortions, we can show that uh, there are only three relevant operators um, that are built from a, a square of the density field, the product of the density and derivative of the density field and displacement field, and um, uh, the second derivative of the density field or the tidal um, uh, field, the tidal shear. Um, and in practice, what we would do is instead of measuring the three-point correlation function, we would uh, take the original density field, filter the field with any of these operators, and then compute the cross-correlation of that field with the original density field. In this way, we will have um, uh, we, we will have a data vector containing three observables uh, that each have com computational complexity of a power spectrum. Uh, when we have primordial long Gaussianity, for instance, of the local shape, we would need a new set, uh, set of um, skew spectra, which are now constructed from gravitational potential. So um, now when we do the analysis, we will have a data vector that contains these different power spectrum-like um, estimators. And then we can, uh, for instance, do a Fisher forecast to see how the information content of this new data vector com compares with the bispectrum. And uh, in this case, we considered uh, uh, fixing the cosmology and only varying the bias parameters and the stochastic correction to a Poisson uh, uh, noise, as well as the FML. So we showed that for a survey like DESI, the measurements of the skew spectra, uh, which are shown with blue contours, agree rather uh, very well with the measurements of uh, parameters from the bi spectrum. And this is really encouraging. And the, the plot on the left shows the constraints uh, when we have local non Gaussianity, while the plot on the right shows the constraint when we have massive particles with spin 2. So um, this is very encouraging, um, but now the real life is more complicated than that because we measure uh, the tracers in, in redshift space. So when we include redshift space distortions, now instead of three or four um, 
um, operators, we need uh, uh, 14 of these skew spectra to capture the information uh, uh, in, uh, in the bias spectrum if the initial conditions are Gaussian. If you have non-Gaussianity, we would need a few extra skew spectra. Um, but then we, we went on to compare the prediction, the theoretical prediction of, predictions of these 14 skew spectra against the measurements on simulations. And here are the results um, of these 14 skew spectra. The solid line shows the th theoretical prediction, while the orange dots are the measurements on the full n body simulations. And here we have made the measurements on matter density field. And the blue dots show the synthetic density field that is generated using perturbation theory. So as we can see, there is a quite a good agreement between simulation and theory. The agreement is uh, slightly uh, worse uh, for the full n-body simulations compared to the synthetic field based on perturbation theory. And this is largely driven by uh, nonlinearities in dark matter density and more importantly, the velocities. And that is not captured by perturbation theory that was used to construct these skew spectra. Now, we expect a better agreement if we make a similar measurements on, uh, for bias tracers, because in that case, the velocities are, are um, smaller and the impact of nonlinearities of velocities is expected to be less pronounced than the one on uh, matter fluctuations. So then we can be asked the question of how sensitive are these skew spectra to the parameters that we want to constrain, namely the bias parameters, the growth rate, and um, the FNL, well, we didn't have the FNL here, but uh, that's, that's a general question. And uh, since we did not carry out a full likelihood analysis uh, fitting the skew spectra to the simulation and, um, and, and uh, inferring the values of these parameters, we use the synthetic second order um, uh, field generated from perturbation theory um, and, and varied the values in which we could vary the value of biases and see how much the skew spectra change. As you can see, they are more sensitive to the linear bias and the growth factor, but there is a in shape information on the other biases as well. Now, uh, let me kind of summarize here that the, the, uh, the, the interest in these skew spectra is largely the, their computational cost because measuring the, and the, all the triangular configurations to, to measure by spectrum and then to analyze by spectrum is a rather you know, challenging task. Um, so here we have built set of estimators that reduce the computational uh, cost from um, n, n cube, where n is the number of Fourier modes in the, in the analysis, to n log n analysis. Of course, there has been significant amount of work in reducing computational cost of by spectrum measurements, but this is an alternative path that is uh, complementary and, and uh, potentially more efficient to standard by spectrum measurements. Now, having done this analysis, of course, the next step is first to do a full likelihood analysis against simulations and eventually to apply these uh, estimators to existing data and account for observational effects and so on um, to, to quantify their, uh, their information content. So with this, let me now um, put my conclusion. I showed exciting prospect for constraining local non gaussianity with intensity mapping. Um, I uh, illustrated the significant information in the bispectrum of bias tracers. Uh, for local shape, it's most relevant when we only have loose priors. And I will show the power spectrum only constraints are dominated by the choice of prior on linear non gaussian bias p phi while the bias spectrum constraints are um, mildly dependent on uh, loose priors on B phi delta. There can be a systematic shift in, in, in uh, inferred value of FNL if we impose very strong priors on non-Gaussian biases. And there is an encouraging prospect for constraining massive particles with non-zero spin using large scale structure by spectrum. And finally, the weighted skew spectra can potentially be uh, an efficient alternative estimator for three-point statistic that is uh, specifically interesting for constraints on local non on FNL in general and biases and growth rate. So here I will stop and uh, I will look forward to the discussion during the live sessions. Thank you.